this video will be continuing force problems and we'll be focusing on centripetal forces and gravitational forces. So in the first problem we have a bucket of water weighing 30 newtons that is spun in a vertical circle by a rope that is one meter long and we want to find the minimum speed of the bucket for the water to not fall out. So begin by drawing a little picture. So the water is going to fall out if it falls out it's going to fall out at the top and at the top we only have a single force that's acting, and it's acting down, and that's the weight, so the 30 newton uh, bucket of water. And this is also the direction of our radial acceleration, because when things move in a circle, they accelerate inwards to change their direction. Okay, so I have a weight of 30 newtons, and the radius of my circular motion is going to be the length of this rope that's swinging it around for one meter. So now I can do Newton's laws just like with all of um, force problems. So if I sum up the forces, in this case in the radial direction, all I have is the weight. And I set that equal to mass times acceleration. But since my bucket is going in a circle, this is going to be radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration. And centripetal acceleration, radial acceleration, depending on what you call it, is equal to V squared over R. Okay, so if we plug that in, our weight is mg equals mass times radial acceleration or V squared over R. Here our mass will cancel out since it's in both terms. We can divide by it and get rid of it. And if we solve for the velocity, so just move our r over times g and take a square root. And plugging in 1 meter times 9.8 meters per second squared and taking the square root, we get a velocity of 3.1 meters per second for the water to not fall out. The next problem, we have a 10 gram fly that rests on a spinning disc 20 centimeters from the center. And we're asked to find the maximum speed of the disc that it can spin without the fly sliding if the coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25. So if I draw a little picture, um, we have this fly. I don't know if it's at the edge of the disc but it's 20 centimeters from the center so put that at 0 0.2 meters from the center and so it's going to be traveling in a circular path as the disc spins and all the while friction is going to be keeping it from sliding out. Okay, so static friction is going to be accelerating it inwards or changing its direction and keeping it from sliding out. So, if we write everything we know, the mass is 10 grams or 0.01 kilograms just in case we need it. The radius of our circular path is 20 centimeters or 0 0.2 meters and our coefficient of static friction is 0 0.25. Okay, So since there's friction I'm going to begin by summing up the forces in the y direction. So if I do that First, maybe I draw a free body diagram. If you're looking at the fly from the side, then you have a normal force up and a weight that is down. Okay, so that means we have a normal force minus the weight, and that is equal to the mass times acceleration. But since the fly isn't coming off the table or going through it, um, or the disc, then the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So this tells us that the normal force is equal to the weight or the fly's mass times 
gravitational acceleration. Now I'm going to sum up the forces in the radial direction. Okay, so along um, the radius of motion. Okay, so I'm going to call that sum of FR. And in this case, we only have static friction. Okay, and so that's going to be equal to mass times radial acceleration. Okay, now we know that the fly is accelerating inwards because it's going in a circle. Radial acceleration is always um, toward the center. It's also called centripetal acceleration, which means center seeking. And so since it's accelerating toward the center and our force of static friction is also toward the center, these need to be in the same direction. So we're going to define toward the center as the positive direction. So that's why um, friction doesn't have a minus sign. And if we substitute our formula for static friction, mu s times the normal force, we get mu s n equals m times radial acceleration, which is v squared over r. And then we found the normal force is just mass times gravitational acceleration in the previous step. So I can write mu s times mg is equal to mv squared over r. I have a mass in both terms, so that will go away. And then if I solve for the velocity, I need to move my r over. So r times mu s g, and then take a square root. This will give me square root of 0.2 meters times 0.25, my coefficient, times 9.8 meters per second squared. I take the square root of all that, and I get 0.7 meters per second. And it turns out that even if I wasn't given the mass of the fly, it didn't really matter anyway. It just canceled out. Okay, in the next problem, riding on a roller coaster, you feel lighter at the top of a loop and heavier at the bottom. If you are moving at 35 meters per second around a 10 meter radius vertical loop, find the weight you feel at the top and the bottom if you are 70 kilograms. So, I'm going to draw a vertical loop that we might go on on a roller coaster. And we're interested in how heavy we are at the top versus at the bottom. So we need a free body diagram at the top and bottom. When we're at the top, our weight is going to be down. And we're also underneath the surface of the roller coaster, so there's going to be a normal force that is also pushing us down. Okay, And then when we're at the bottom, now we have a normal force that's pushing us up, keeping us from going through the seat and we have our weight that is straight down. Okay, so the only difference in top and bottom is really the direction of the normal force that the roller coaster is pushing on us. And then at all points, our acceleration is radial or toward the center since we're going in a circle. Okay, so I'm going to start with the top. So at the top, I will sum up all of the forces so I'm going to do this in the, I'm going to call it the radial direction since we're going in a circle. Okay, so all the forces along the radius of our circular path. This is going to be a positive weight and a positive normal force. We'll set that equal to mass times radial acceleration. And these are all positive because we need these forces to be in the same direction as our acceleration. And since the radial acceleration is inward, and our weight and normal force are also inward, they must have the same sign. Okay, so we make them all positive. Okay, and then I'm going to substitute mg in for my weight. So mg plus n. And then radial acceleration is given by v squared over r. Okay, so a radial or centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. Okay, so if I solve for n, 
I get mv squared over r minus mg. And if I wanted to, I could factor out this n, make it a little easier to plug in my calculator. And this is really what I'm looking for. The normal force is going to tell us how heavy we feel. Okay? Because that's how much the roller coaster is pushing on us, so that's how much we um, feel like we weigh. So if we plug in 70 kilograms times 35 meters per second all squared over a 10 meter radius loop minus 9.8 meters per second squared we feel like we weigh 7,890 newtons okay so now we can do the same thing at the bottom We sum up the forces in the radial direction. Now our normal force is pointing along radial acceleration direction, but our weight is in the opposite direction. Okay, so set that equal to m a radial. And if I solve for the normal force, I get mv squared over r. This time, I'm going to add my weight, okay? And again, if I want to factor out m, I get m times v squared over r plus g, okay? So this was my weight from here. And since it's negative on the left, when I move it over, it becomes positive. Okay, so the only difference here is my weight was in the opposite direction of the radial acceleration so here I get a minus sign, where here I get a plus sign. And if I plug all of that in, I get 70 kilograms times 35 meters per second squared over 10 meter radius plus 9.8 meters per second squared. And then that equals 9,260 newtons, okay? So this is why you feel lighter at the top and heavier at the bottom. Okay, the next problem, we have a 30 kilogram mass and a 50 kilogram mass that are held apart at a distance of 1.5 meters in outer space. And we wanna find the initial acceleration of each mass the moment they are released. Okay, so we have a Mass A that is 30 kilograms and it is 1.5 meters from mass B, which is 50 kilograms. I'm just labeling, labeling them A and B to keep up with them. Okay, so now if we find acceleration for mass A first, I'm going to start by summing up the forces on A, okay? So if I sum up the forces, the only thing acting in outer space is going to be the force of gravity between the two masses, okay? So the force of gravity is big G times the product of the two masses, mass A times mass B, mass B, over the distance between them squared. And this is going to equal the mass, I'm looking at object A, so mass A times the acceleration of object A. Okay, So these are always um, for the object you are interested in. Okay, So if you cancel out MA, since it's on both sides, you get that the acceleration of mass A is big G times MB, mass of object B, over their distance squared. Big G has a value of 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11. If you forget it, you can look it up. It's 
especially the units. And then the mass of B is 50 kilograms and the distance is 1.5 meters. We can't forget to square it. Okay, forgetting to square this distance is a very common mistake. If we plug all of that in, we get 1.48 times 10 to the minus 9 meters per second squared. Okay, so because big G is such a weak, uh, such a small number, that tells us how weak gravity is. And even though we're, we have two masses that are close together, they're not going to accelerate very much. Okay, so now if I find the same thing for mass B, going to sum up the forces on B. Again, it's just the force of gravity. And that's going to be big G times mass A times mass B over their distance squared. But this time I'm summing up the forces on mass B. And I'm going to get the acceleration of mass B. So this time it is mass B that cancels. And the acceleration of B is big G times MA over R squared. And again, if we plug this big number in, and we notice that the acceleration of one mass depends on the mass of the other and vice versa. Their mass doesn't matter. And when we plug this in, we get 8.9 times 10 to the minus 10th meters per second squared. So it's a sm smaller number slightly because mass B is a little bit heavier, but again, it's still pretty small because gravity is so weak. Okay, our next problem, an object that weighs 4,000 newtons on Earth is sent to the moon of a distant planet that has a mass of 1.4 times 10 to the 23 kilograms and radius of 2.575 times 10 to the six meters. Find the weight of this object on this moon. So first we have the weight of this object on Earth, which is given by the mass times the gravitational acceleration on the Earth, and that's equal to 4,000 newtons. So one thing that doesn't change no matter where you are is your mass, where your weight and the gravitational acceleration might change. So we want to find out what our mass is. So we can do this by dividing both sides by G, or 9.8 meters per second squared. And we get that our mass is, or this object, has a mass of 408 kilograms. Okay. Now, we know that the weight of this object on the moon is just equal to the force of gravity between this object and the moon itself. Okay, So this is going to be big G times the mass of our object times the mass of this moon on this planet, a lot of m's, over the distance between them squared. But this is just going to correspond to the radius of this moon since our object is going to be at the surface. And so if we just plug in 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11th Newton meters squared per kilogram squared for big G, then our mass is, our object's mass is 408 kilograms times 1.4 times 10 to the 23rd kilograms of the moon over its radius squared, 2.525 times 10 to the six meters squared, we get that the weight of our object on this moon is 575 newtons. Okay, so quite a bit smaller than the weight on Earth. Next problem, we have your weight on Earth is 1500 newtons. And we want to find how far above the Earth's surface should you be for your weight to be cut in half. Okay, so first off, your weight is equal to the force of gravity. So that's G times your mass 
times the mass of the Earth over the distance between you and the center of the Earth squared. Okay, so this is a very important piece. If you were on the surface of the Earth, your weight would be given by, um, your distance would be the Earth's radius. But in this case, if you're some distance above the Earth, this is going to be the Earth's radius plus your height above the surface. Okay, so the total distance between you and the center of the Earth. So if I were to draw this, this is my Earth. And we're going to be way out here. The radius of the Earth is this distance. And then our height above the Earth is this. And so the total R that we need to plug into this equation is going to be the radius of the Earth plus the height above it. Okay? And we're just going to call that R. Okay? So one thing that we might want to do, first of all, is find our weight. So we know our weight, our, our mass, sorry. So one thing we might want to... So one thing we might want to do is find our mass, which is going to be our weight divided by g, or 1,500 newtons divided by 9.8 meters per second squared, or 153 kilograms. Okay. Now, I want to come to this equation and solve for when my weight is 0 0.5, or 1 half, of my weight on Earth, and that's going to be when I am this distance r away. Okay, so I'm solving for the distance r when my weight is one half or 0 0.5 times my weight on Earth. Okay, so if I were to solve this for r. I would have to multiply by r, um, or by r squared, and then I need to divide by this and bring it over, and then take the square root, okay? So there's a little bit of algebra there, but it would be g times my two masses over 0 0.5 times the weight on Earth. If I plug this in, it's gonna be quite large. 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared. My mass is 153 kilograms. And the mass of Earth, if you don't know this, you could look it up, or it would be given 5.97 times 10 to the 24 fourth kilograms. Okay, that's my top. And then 0 0.5 times the weight on Earth, which is 1,500 newtons. And if you plug all of that in, you get your distance from the center of Earth should be 9 times 10 to the 6 meters. Or this is 9,000 kilometers. But that's not what we were looking for. We were looking for our height above the Earth. So if we take this equation our height is going to be our total distance minus Earth's radius, or 9 times 10 to the 6 meters minus 6.56 times 10 to the 6 meters, the radius of Earth. You could also look that up. And we get 2.4 times 10 to the 6 meters, or um, 24 hundred kilometers above Earth. Next problem, we have a 1250 kilogram satellite that orbits in a circular path with a radius of 8,000 kilometers, and we want to find the period of the satellite's motion. So first off, our mass of our satellite is 1250 kilograms. It's going to orbit with a circular 
uh, a radius of its circular path of 8,000 kilometers, okay, or this is 8 times 10 to the 6th meters, okay. And so we want to sum up the forces. Since it's going in a circle, we're going to do that radially. So if you have a satellite that is going around the Earth, it's going in a circle. It's going around the Earth. So the only force is the force of gravity, or big G times the mass of the satellite times the mass of the Earth over the total distance squared. So that's our R. And this is going to equal the mass times acceleration. Since we're going in a circle, it's going to be radial acceleration. And so here we get G times the mass of the satellite times the mass of the Earth over the distance squared is equal to the mass, and this is the mass of the satellite, because that's the object we're interested in, times mv squared over r, substituting for radial acceleration. And so at this point, we have a lot of things we can cancel out. The mass of the satellite occurs in both terms, and one of our r's goes away. So now if we solve for v by just taking the square root of both sides, we get the square root of g times the mass of the Earth over our distance r. And this is square root of 6.674 times 10 to the minus 11 newton meters squared per kilogram squared times 5.97 times 10 to the 24th kilograms, the mass of the Earth, which you could look up. And our radius is 8 times 10 to the 6th meters. And this gives us a speed of 7,057 meters per second. It's pretty fast. So now we know, uh, now that we know our velocity, we know the velocity for a circular path is just the distance over time. And the distance of a circular path is just the circumference, or 2 pi r. And the time we give to, um, for one path or one complete cycle is the period, capital T. So if we solve for capital T, we just move T up and the velocity down. And we get it's 2 pi times r8 times 10 to the 6 meters over our 7,057 meters per second. And we get the period is 7,123 seconds. Or, if you wanted, this is roughly 119 minutes, or roughly two hours. So two hours for the satellite to orbit the Earth. Your last problem, imagine there is no air resistance on Earth's surface. How fast would you need to throw a baseball horizontally to put it in orbit around the Earth? Okay, so I'm going to draw an exaggerated picture. This is the Earth, and I have a pitcher. It's going to throw horizontally, and he needs to throw fast enough that the baseball orbits the Earth. Okay, but because our baseball player is very short, the distance between the ball and the center of the Earth is roughly the Earth's radius. Okay, So it's not quite as big as I've drawn it here. Hopefully that's obvious. And so our force on the baseball is just going to be the weight. And near Earth's surface, that's just mg. We don't have to write the full um, force of gravity. And so this is going to equal mass times radial acceleration, since we're throwing it into an orbit, a circular orbit around the Earth. And so this gives us mg equals mv squared over r. And our mass is going to cancel. 
both sides. And we get that g equals b squared over r. So the velocity is just going to be, and this is going to be the Earth's radius. Our velocity is going to be g times radius of the Earth, all square root. So if you plug that in, square root of 9.8 meters per second squared times 6.56 6 times 10 to the sixth meters, we get a speed of 7,381 meters per second. Okay, so that's pretty fast. And it's roughly how fast our satellite was orbiting earlier, but it was a little bit higher up, so it didn't have to go as fast. Not only that, but it's pretty interesting to note, the velocity that you need to throw something to get it into orbit is independent of the object's mass. And so it doesn't matter how big something is, as long as you get it going fast enough, it can be put into orbit without falling toward the Earth.